It's been a collaboration between me as the Assistant Secretary General responsible for the Science, Peace and Security Project uh, and the Ministry of Education and Science in Ukraine. Um, what made it different this time is, of course, that since the war uh, uh, and the invasion uh, in February 2022, uh, we've seen that innovation is playing a large role in the war and in countering the Russian invasion. So what we wanted to do is to add a layer to the cooperation we already had, and that was by holding the first ever NATO-Ukraine high-level dialogue on innovation. And that's where Minister Fedorov uh, came in as the Minister for uh, Digital Transformation, uh, uh, so we could discuss what would be potential avenues, how we can help Ukraine in the very short term, when it comes down to innovation, that actually can make a difference now on the battlefield, uh, and we see brilliant initiatives coming out of Ukraine and the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, so that, that's fantastic to see for us, uh, but also in the medium term, uh, as we're all grappling with the fact uh, that the future of war in the current world of innovation uh, is more uncertain uh, day by day. This is Dmitros Kruko, National News Agency of Ukraine. So far as I uh, was in time to notice, Mr. Fyodorov is a great fan for uh, in, in, in artificial intelligence. So that uh, uh, was there some kind of project in that field? And uh, the second issue, could we please specify? It's obvious uh, that, uh, uh, you know, partnership uh, in uh, the scientific te technology is profitable for Ukraine. But what kind of uh, use you have uh, from uh, cooperating with Ukraine? Uh, do you have some kind of, you know, some kind of innovation you value? Thank you. Thank you. On, on artificial intelligence, it actually came up throughout the whole conversation because AI is a foundational technology. Uh, it is like, like butter on bread. It is uh, on, on cheese sandwiches and on ham sandwiches. It, 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 it's permeating everywhere. So if you're talking about energy resilience uh, and how can we have a smarter system in deciding how to build your energy grid, then AI is a very large part of that. Uh, if we look at a better detection of drones, uh, then algorithms are really going to help in predicting uh, how uh, they work or in better detecting uh, where the drones are or in filtering them out from uh, distinguishing between a bird and a drone. Um, so in all the topics that I mentioned, AI will be a key technology. And, and I think, well, we're all learning now with the, the come of ChatGPT that it is all around us and, and can be used everywhere, uh, so definitely also in, in the projects here. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about uh, uh, the win-win the, the of cooperation, let me make one general point, that in general, uh, if Ukraine prevails, uh, that is also a win for NATO. Uh, and no, if it will prevail. <laughs> it will prevail, and of course we stand behind you. So uh, in general, uh, we're not bean counting on uh, every uh, piece of uh, assistance that we give. Uh, but there is a definite win for NATO here, uh, because you are now uh, experiencing uh, a, a real uh, testing ground for new technologies uh, and a very quick experience in what works and what doesn't work. Um, so to gain that knowledge of you, your armed forces finding out uh, what works, what is actually beneficial, how can you best operate drones, because it's not only about technology, it's also about how you use it. Uh, in a concept. Uh, so there we have a lot to learn also from uh, Ukraine uh, and of course there are also opportunities from countries, for, um, companies from uh, allied countries uh, to actually uh, provide their services to Ukraine but then also gain that insight into uh, what they need to improve uh, in order to, to benefit. Can I ask you about the uh, public-private partnership? It is a key, as I understand, uh, for new kind of technologies. What are the incentives uh, could uh, we or NATO or NATO countries find uh, to stimulate them uh, to produce some kind of technology which could be used on the battlefield? Because it's yeah. a slightly different, you know, point of view. And uh, as we uh, saw uh, by the uh, these um, Starlink uh, system. There was like very subjective, uh, subjective um, factors, which were influential uh, for for that kind of uh, software. Uh, what lessons have you learned? Uh, could it happen that uh, 
private owner just suddenly changed his mind and uh, all the troops just remained without any kind of communication, for instance. So, very good question. And, and um, our problem analysis is that if you look back a few decades in time, then most of the new inventions came from government funding. Uh, and more specifically, mostly it was military funding. So, GPS, uh, the internet itself, uh, something simple like Velcro. Uh, a lot of these inventions came out of uh, military research and development, then were used and regulated and tested in the military environment, and then later became uh, available for civilians. Uh, GPS, for example, in the beginning uh, was made available for commercial use, but with a lower accuracy than the military GPS actually could provide. Uh, to avoid that risk. Nowadays, it's the other way around. Uh, new inventions come out of the private sector. Uh, a lot of times they even come out of startups or spin-offs out of universities, uh, and they're game-changing. Mm. Uh, so the question is, how do we not get left behind as uh, defense forces in uh, the innovations that are out there? And as I said, most of them are dual use. So the question is, how do we quicker connect uh, those two worlds? Um, the main problem setting there is that a lot of innovators don't know what the military needs, uh, so they don't even take it into account in developing an app. They are thinking about a business model and a market uh, for things, but they're not thinking about uh, security and defense as a, as a, a way to develop for. Uh, the other problem is that a lot of the military doesn't know what new technologies are out there that could solve problems that they're now encountering. So by bringing together those two communities, uh, that is a big step in enhancing that public-private partnership. And you said, well, how do you make incentives for the private sector to do that? Uh, I think Ukraine shows us that a lot of the private sector actually wants to be part of the good fight uh, in this conflict, uh, and therefore is very much willing uh, to work for uh, defense and, and develop. At the same time, why I said dual use is so important, because it is good to have a commercial business model uh, that provides for better, more money for research and development for the next generation than if you're only dependent on uh, a government to, to support you. So that's the dual use. And then you ask me the question, what does that mean for regulation of this technology? Well, that's a discussion we all need to have uh, worldwide. Let's be honest, without one private person, there would not have been a Starlink system uh, that provided the solution in a time when all other communication was done. Nobody ever asked for a Starlink system, uh, but we were all happy that it was there, and we're still happy that it's all there because it's still making a big difference in this war. Uh, so the private sector, we need to come to grips with the fact that the private sector owns a lot of our infrastructure that is actually crucial for defense and security, and therefore we need to uh, stay in, in, in a constant dialogue uh, about ethical uses, norms, uh, etc. But I think Ukraine is an example where companies like Microsoft and Starlink uh, actually stood up uh, and, and did the right thing. Coming back to AI, uh, in a few days, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the G7 countries uh, are going to discuss uh, some kind of et ethical norms in uh, using uh, the uh, AI. So that uh, do you in NATO have some kind of principles which you already now follow or would like to follow you and all other countries in the world? No, we have these principles. Uh, so we have an AI strategy for security and defense uh, because we very much believe that if we don't take our own norms and values seriously with new technologies, um, then we are losing what we're fighting for. Uh, so we need to take our values onto the battlefield, and that also means in the use of technologies like AI. So one and a half years ago, we agreed with all the allies on an AI strategy, and part of that AI strategy are principles of responsible use, uh, and they delineate how we want AI to function, uh, and what are the minimum uh, uh, demands that we put on this AI. Uh, I'll name a few examples. One is bias mitigation, so we don't want especially early AI, uh, tends to have a bias uh, because it starts to look for patterns and if uh, patterns then become the, uh, the truth, uh, then accidents happen and, and you, 
don't have to Google very far to see how people got fired or got arrested uh, on the basis of uh, these early and simple algorithms that were biased. Uh, so that's one of the things that we don't want. Uh, another thing that we want is reliability. So we need to know in 100% of the cases what the AI will do, especially when it comes down to more difficult decisions, when it comes down to life or death, which are being taken in the world of, of defense and security. So we've delineated quite early on how we want our AI to function. Uh, and of course, we hope that that will become the world standard, uh, because that would mean that we run less risks from technologies like AI. We have uh, now a hybrid uh, form of the war, where software uh, is combined by the hardware on the battlefield. Do you expect to see all these trenches, all these you know waves of uh, uh, combat meat coming to the uh, enemy uh, from Russian side, and uh, was it like principally change the concept, or the vision NATO had about the uh, warfare as such? Because before, uh, a lot of countries were preparing for some kind of stabilization, peacekeeping, something like that. But now we have absolutely different situation. So, what is lessons you learned from? So the first lesson we already learned in 2008 when Georgia was attacked and in 2014 when Crimea was uh, uh, taken by, uh, by Russia. Uh, so I think that was the first move for NATO, the first wake-up call, uh, that this was not a world where we would only bring stability and peace in uh, countries far from NATO territory, but that we actually face an existential threat close to our borders. So already then, in 2014, we had the Wills Pledge, so the 2% spending of GDP on defense uh, pledge. We started to uh, station troops in uh, the Baltic countries uh, as a deterrent effect towards Russia. So that uh, movement was already put in place, uh, but I think it's definitely been uh, put in a, a, a roller coaster or a, a, a rapid after the invasion last year in, in February. Uh, so it was hard to imagine to, such a large-scale war in Europe, uh, but it's happening. Uh, and no, it's not over in a few months. Uh, and yes, we need all the material we, we see now on the battlefield in order to be able to withstand and defend for a longer time. So one of the issues you will see in Vil uh, Vilnius is indeed increased readiness of NATO troops. Uh, it is looking at defense industry because we see that we need more production capacity than we had over the past decades uh, to be order to be able to be ready for for deterring uh, Russia and defending the uh, the alliance. At the same time, it is now extra, of course, because we are also uh, allies are supplying uh, large quantities to Ukraine, uh, which are needed now to uh, uh, regain uh, the territory, and and so that there's a. A real need to rethink the way uh, we uh, organize them.